How about we come before God in prayer because we're about to come before his word, so it's really important that we ask for his help. So let me lead us in prayer. Let's quieten our hearts and minds after we sing a great song. Heavenly Father, we come to you today and we ask you to please help us to accept your word humbly planted in us. Please feed us, please restore us, please change us, please shape us. We pray by your Holy Spirit as we listen to your word this morning. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. Today, brothers and sisters, we're going to let God's word in Ephesians 5. We've been going through Ephesians as a, as a young church. We're going to let that part of the Bible, the New Testament, Ephesians 5, expose us to perhaps sometimes it's called a controversial issue among Christians today. What does it mean for a Christian wife to submit to her husband? What does it mean for a Christian husband to be head of his wife? doesn't need to be controversial, but sadly we live in a politically correct sort of world and you're not allowed to talk about certain matters. Uh, and maybe as Christians sometimes we can get a little embarrassed and maybe um, defensive about what God's word's saying. We try and say, well, it's not really saying what it's really saying, and we try to tie ourselves in knots, but it actually is really what it's really saying. Just let it speak. Um, it is, you see, if this is God's word, if you're a Christian here today, if this is God's word, then we can stand with absolute confidence that his word will set us free. And that his word is infinitely superior than any word from the world or people or anyone, what they say. And that God's way is always the best. We can have great confidence in that. Now before we look at today's passage uh, from Ephesians 5, I thought I'd give us some intro notes. So think of this like an entree, if you like. We're about to have the main meal. This is, this is the entree. In your talk outline, you'll see the five notes or the five things on our entree plate. The first thing to, to get right is to realise or to know that God is our creator and that he created marriage. Marriage, marriage, is not a human invention. It's not a government idea. It's not created by the humanity and philosophies department of universities. From the beginning of time, marriage has been God's plan and pattern for men and women who have been created in his image. That's the first thing to realise, or to get, to, to get straight. God is our creator. He created marriage. Secondly, no matter what legislation is put in place or new theories developed or, or cultural norms accepted, since God created marriage, he gets to define marriage. Um, and that is, the Bible is absolutely clear on this. Absolutely clear. One man, one woman, not related to each other, not directly related to each other, but joining together in marriage uh, till death do us part. And no government or institution or people can redefine what God has already defined. Now I know that marriage can mean all sorts of things today. I know that, I'm not stupid. Uh, and I don't doubt that in time to come that marriage will be most likely between more than two people. You can have marriage between three people. Or you can probably marry your dog or your, or your robot or your EV car or whatever it is. I, I know you can call all sorts of things marriage today, which is why I think it's really helpful and from now I always use the adjective Christian marriage to remind us of what God has defined and what he has declared. So I'm talking about this morning Christian marriage. Third, third entree uh, point is, again, no matter what society or legislation says, God creates men and women in his own image. Some of you have had the privilege of being in a delivery room in a hospital. Some of you have given birth. At this, not at this church. You, you've come to this church. You've given birth in delivery rooms. It's one of, there's dads here. You've been in the delivery room. Maybe you're a midwife. You've caught babies. Maybe you've been a sister or an aunt or a support person to someone giving birth. I can guarantee that all over the world, all over the world, in delivery rooms, all over the world, you will never hear this phrase when a baby is born. Oh, it's a human. 
Oh, it's a cute human. Now what's said? It's a boy. In our case, three times over, it's a girl. I don't need to tell you how we work that out. But I might need to remind us that God makes boys and girls equal in dignity, equal as his image bearers, equal as co-heirs in Christ, equal but different. Different in function, different in roles, different, in, different physically, different emotionally and definitely intellectually if you've ever sat in a classroom. We know girls are smarter than boys except for Dr. William at this church. He's a different category. But God makes men and women equal but different. Fourth point, humanity all over the world has so butchered God's created order all over the world and for, for, for time, forever, whether that's in the realm of marriage or gender or sexuality, we've taken God's good design and we've made a mess of it. And we need God to come down and intervene in the mess that we've made. Sinfulness reigns supreme in our world, in our lives, and we need God to restore and to repair the messiness and the brokenness and the confusion that's there in our lives, that's there in society, that's there maybe in our marriages, that's there even in our churches. And so the gospel says to us, let Jesus come and rule your life. Let him call the shots. Let him be the boss in charge of your life and let him take your sins away. Let him take all your failures and, and, and faults away and you get his grace and his forgiveness and new life, adoption into his family and a guaranteed welcome home for all eternity. The gospel restores what is broken in you and me. Fifth point fifth on your entree plate, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 to 33, the passage we'll be looking at, has clear instructions for husbands and wives, but it applies to every Christian, whether married or single or divorced or separated or widowed or engaged. Gloria Furman puts it like this on the screen. I thought it was a very helpful quote, so I'll give it to you on the screen. All believers, single or married, are betrothed to Christ our bridegroom and will be arrayed in splendour at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Always remember, our identity is never tied up to whether we're married or single, whether you're in a relationship or not. That doesn't define who you are. Our identity is grounded in two realities. Number one, we are made in the image of God and therefore precious in his sight. And number two, we are remade by the power of the Holy Spirit and loved by Christ Jesus. Have a read of Ephesians chapter 1 if you ever doubt that you are loved. And for the married people here today, which there's many of us, the application for this Bible talk will be fairly obvious. But for the single or the unmarried, the application becomes pray for others, pray for yourself if you hope and long to be married and help each other stay true to God's word in a society that is always wanting to downgrade and denigrate the Bible and biblical Christianity. So there's five notes before we actually begin our passage today. We're looking at God created marriage, God defines marriage, men and women are created equal in the image of God. Um, our sinfulness has really messed up God's created order, God's good design, and this passage applies to every Christian. This is a passage you'll need to have open in front of you. So those notes are in your outline as well, and you've got to talk out and help you, but please turn to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 to 33, and Evelyn uh, is going to read this passage to us. Evelyn's been married to Bob, I think probably for about 100 years, but if you ask them, they still struggle uh, with putting this uh, passage into practice. I'm sure they'll agree with that because when two sinful people come together, there's going to be problems. But let's read about God's pattern for uh, husbands and wives. Thank you, Evelyn. Take it away. Ephesians chapter 5, starting with verse 21. 
Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its saviour. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendour, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies, he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one has ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Thank you. Now, this reading that Evelyn just gave us doesn't stand in isolation to what Paul has written. In the, it's part of a letter to the church in Ephesus. So since chapter 4, verse 1, he's actually been outlining... Uh, the Apostle Paul has been outlining for the church back in Ephesus and for us, what does it mean to learn Christ? What does it mean to walk in a manner worthy of the name of Jesus if you're a Christian? What does it mean to enrol in the school of Christ? Therefore, you've got new standards of living. What does that look like? Don't live like the world, you're a new creation. We've got a new wardrobe, uh, a new dress sense. We've got a new walk. We've seen that the last few weeks. And we are now a spirit-filled people, a spirit-filled church, a spirit-filled followers of Jesus. And last week, uh, you might recall if you were here, uh, there was three aspects to this spirit-filled living, this spirit-filled church that Paul wanted to draw attention to. Fellowship and worship, thankfulness and submission. And now verse 21 is a picture or an outworking of this spirit-filled life or another outworking of this spirit-filled life. So look at verse 21. It really I know our English translations often have a heading, wives and husbands. Verse 21 is really part of, it should be linked to verse 22. Submitting, verse 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And having introduced the idea of submission, Paul then goes on to say, and this is what it looks like in these realms of life. So firstly, marriage. Next week we'll see the home or parenting and the week after uh, in the workplace. What does submission look like? So in the next three Bible talks we'll be exploring this theme. So that's where we're going and that's how it fits in together, this passage here. Now back in 1979, John Stott, an English pastor, wrote this on the screen. The very notion of submission is out of fashion today. 1979 he wrote that. It is totally at variance, at odds, with contemporary attitudes of permissiveness and freedom. So people say, if you're going to submit, you lose your freedom. That's what's behind that sort of idea. But right across the Bible, submission is never a dirty word and it's never out of fashion. It's never on the wrong side of history. In fact, submission is a life-giving word. And it's essential for living in a society as God ordains. It's why the Bible starts with the very first words, in the beginning, God. That's how the Bible starts, in the beginning, God. So all of creation submits to the creator, our God. And so submission actually happens in, in, in every aspect of life. So think about it, submission happens... Uh, in the realm of government and to authorities. It's why normal people stop at red lights. You submit to the red light in front of you. It's why normal people obey the fireman when he says, get out of the building, it's burning. You don't say, you're not superior to me, Mr. Fireman, I'm going to stay here. You submit to a fireman if he tells you to get out. You, you, that's why we pay our taxes and our rates. 
You don't ride your bike, hopefully you don't, you don't ride your bike in the middle of Canberra Airport on the tarmac because you submit to this dirty great big plane is going to land on top of you. Uh, you don't buy ammo for your rifle at Aldi and Costco. We submit to the laws of this land. You have to go to another country to buy, buy that. Church, church leadership, we submit to church leadership. Without church leadership, it would be a chaos, it'd be a nightmare to be part of a church with no leadership. Children submit to their parents, not the other way around. Teenagers take note. You submit to your boss in most matters, otherwise you won't have a job. You submit when you go to the vampire nurse to give blood. Your doctor gives you a you get to go have blood test and you're told to fast. You don't say, well, stuff you, doctor. I'm going to stuff my face and then have my blood test. No, you submit. You take your, your blood and you fast. A church submits to Jesus, not the other way around. Jesus doesn't submit to the church. See, submission happens everywhere. It needs to happen everywhere. Submission is willingly coming under the authority of others. Willingly coming under the authority of others. It's a human, it's a humble recognition rather of the divine order that God has set in place for his world. And submission is for everyone. No one escapes God's good design for his creation. You might have heard the story of Muhammad Ali. One time famous boxer, world champion of the world, Muhammad Ali boarded a plane where he didn't have his seatbelt on and the announcement was made over the PA to put your seatbelt on. He refused. The flight attendant asked him, please, sir, you need to put your seatbelt on. Muhammad Ali replies, Superman don't need no seatbelt. To which the flight attendant uh, replied brilliantly, yeah, but Superman don't need no airplane either. (laughs) Everyone submits Everyone submits to the authority delegated by God. From the Prime Minister down to the P-plate driver, maybe Joseph Lee next week, the Prime Minister and the P-plate driver, we all submit to the lollipop lady in the school zone and obey what she says. She puts the sign up to stop. Submission happens everywhere. I just wanted to start there so we get our heads around this world of submission. And now let's start our passage by looking at verse 32. So look at verse 32 before we go back through the passage. Verse 32 says, This mystery that Paul's been writing about is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So what Paul's been saying, the the reading that Evelyn just gave, verse 32 says, I'm really talking about human marriage pointing us to the divine marriage, to Jesus marrying the church. And this idea of uh, marriage, God marrying the church, Jesus marrying the church, it's not a new one in scripture, it's all there. So on the screen is a quick summary for you. The bride and bridegroom across scripture. So you get Psalms, Ezekiel, Hosea, Isaiah, Jeremiah, always talking about God's love as the bridegroom for his people, the bride. And then you get to the Gospels and surprise, surprise, who's called the bridegroom? It's the Lord Jesus. And then this picture is carried all the way through the New Testament where the church is called the bride and one day will be presented to our bridegroom, the Lord Jesus. And the image of the wedding comes up all the way from the Gospels all the way through the New Testament as well. And what Paul's doing now in verse 32 of our passage is he's carrying this biblical picture to its radical conclusion. Rebecca McLaughlin puts it like this on the screen. My marriage, he writes, isn't ultimately about me and my husband any more than Romeo and Juliet is about the actors playing the title roles. My marriage is about reflecting Jesus and the church. Can you see what she's saying? So you go and watch Romeo and Juliet, you don't spend all your whole time thinking about the actors and the actress. You spend your time thinking about the story of Romeo and Juliet. Well, that's what Paul's doing here. He's saying, Yeah, Christian marriage, but actually it's about the marriage of Jesus to his church. That's the greater reality. So across this passage, Paul is saying every Christian marriage is pointing us to see the marriage made in heaven between Jesus and his church. Our earthly marriages, even though stained and scarred by sin, even though full of faults and failures, nonetheless... It's a picture, it's a metaphor for the reality still to come in heaven. 
that Christian marriage, Paul is writing, is a beautiful illustration of a greater marriage, the greater marriage of Christ to his church. Which is why from this passage, from this passage, and I'll put these three lines on the screen so you can take it in, Christian women find their distinctive role as wives, if you're married, by looking at the way the church, the bride, relates to Jesus, the bridegroom. And Christian men find their distinctive role as husbands, if you're married, by looking at the way Jesus relates to his church. A husband and wife find their model in the role and relationship of Christ and his church. Just give you a moment to take those three lines in. They're very important to understand the foundation of this passage today. And now we'll turn to the distinctive roles that Paul's given. So we'll go back to the passage. So look at verse 22 to 24. First, to spirit-filled Christian wives. Verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands, not other people's husbands or other men, your own husbands, as to the Lord. Verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its saviour. Verse 24, now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Now like Paul does in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he takes us back to the creation to talk about headship and leadership of the husband. So he goes back to creation, but here he also goes forward to redemption so the mention there of the Lord Jesus and he says the Christian wife takes her example of submission as the church submits to Jesus as the head of the church so there's a headship and hierarchy you see that is built into Christian marriage just as there's headship and hierarchy built into Jesus' church now sometimes it's helpful to speak about what the Bible's not saying, just to clear things up loud and clear. So let me do that and talk about what the Bible's not saying. Submission does not mean, submission does not mean the husband takes the place of Jesus, heaven forbid. Submission, submission does not mean the husband's word is absolute. Only God's word carries that sort of authority. Submission does not mean that the Christian wife should follow her husband into sin and disobedience. That's when Acts chapter 5 verse 29 kicks in. We must obey the word of God before the word of people. Whether that's your boss even. I must obey the word of God. Christian, uh, submission does not mean that the Christian wife surrenders all thought and influence and voice and leadership and direction and decision making in a marriage. It does not mean that she remains silent, especially when she thinks and knows that her husband is making foolish decisions and dumb choices. Submission does not mean being a doormat and being walked all over. I don't know where we get that idea from. Submission does not mean not exercising wisdom, godliness, common sense submission does not mean the Christian wife is somehow inferior or more sinful or not very wise now the Bible's super clear on this matter that men and women are all one in Christ Jesus that we all stand equal under grace and we both need to hear those magnificent words from Ephesians 2 verse 8 that we are saved by grace alone in Christ alone, through faith alone. So hopefully that clears up. That's not what submission is about. But what is it then? What, is it, what does it look like? What does it mean? Well, perhaps John Piper, uh, his definition might be helpful. John Piper's a pastor, an author. Some of you might have come across some of his writings. Here's what he's written, and I thought I couldn't improve on the words he's used here, so I've, I've used this as a, summary, as a summary, if you like. Submission is the divine calling of a wife to honour and affirm her husband's leadership and help carry it through according to her gifts. You might like to just ponder that a little bit. I think it's a helpful summary. 
What could it look like? Well, submission is the inclination of your will. I'm talking to Christian wives here. It's the inclination of your will to say yes to support your husband's leadership in the marriage. It's the inner disposition to support your husband's leadership, to speak up, to pray together, to contribute to the marriage, even challenge ideas by your husband. It's the whole idea of a partnership where each contribution is not identical but complementary because of the different roles and responsibilities. So submission is the desire to sit humbly under your husband's leadership, willingly, joyfully, not under coercion, as the church sits humbly under Christ's leadership. And then, Christian wives, notice two little words in the middle of verse 24, just to make it sound even more controversial and countercultural, and maybe one day even put me in jail. Look what it says the submission to your husband's leadership is in everything. Oh, why couldn't he say in some areas that we've agreed on? Why couldn't he write submit in some things? It doesn't even say in proportion to how your husband is like Jesus. It doesn't say only when he makes good decisions that I agree with. It doesn't say in everything with these few exceptions that we've drawn up on our wedding day. In everything really means across all aspects of the married life. Now let's understand God's word in its context here. Very important. Notice two very important words that occur back in verse 24. As to the Lord. That's four words, isn't it? As to the Lord. So submission in everything means, so long as your husband doesn't contradict uh, God's word or lead you into sin, I've mentioned that already, as to the Lord. It's never suggesting unconditional obedience or slavish behaviour. It's never suggesting that you let your husband do their best impression of a North Korean dictator and that you're sort of suppressed and living under this sort of authoritarian regime called marriage. See, as to the Lord is the qualifier. As to the Lord. Now, brothers and sisters, hear this loud and clear this morning. The Christian husband has no right or claim from the scriptures, from the Bible, the Christian husband has no right or claim to subject his wife to physical or emotional or sexual abuse or any other sort of abuse. No right at all from the Bible. And there is no place in a Christian marriage, I'm only talking about Christian marriage this morning, I'm not going to talk about other stuff, I'm talking about Christian marriage, there is no place for Christian marriage, in Christian marriage, no place for domestic violence, ever. And I want to say, if this is an area where you're suffering in, then please don't suffer in silence. Please reach out and speak. Speak to me and Leslie. Speak to Adam and Kayleen. Speak to Bob and Evelyn. If you're not comfortable speaking to guys, speak to Aggie. Speak to Nerida. But please do not remain silent on this issue. If that's you, please speak to someone. Someone you trust. Christian wives, spirit-filled wives... Here is God's word to you. Submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for this is pleasing in God's sight. It's like the Christian wife says, part of my discipleship, part of what it means to follow you, Lord Jesus, is to, I want to live under your headship. And that means I need your help to submit to this guy who's far from perfect. Sometimes he's dumber than a brick. And makes really bad 
decisions and fails big time, but I want to follow your ways, Lord, rather than mine or the ways of this world. Secondly, spirit-filled husbands. Verse 25 to 31 and then verse 33 as well. Now please appreciate the difficult nature of this Christian husband preaching on these verses in front of his dear wife who's sitting in the congregation this morning. Um, it's the beauty and sometimes the struggle of expository preaching, isn't it? I've got to preach what's in front of me. I can't stop at verse 24 and say, okay, let's go to chapter 6 now. It doesn't work that way. By the way, in the original Greek language, the New Testament was written in a Greek language, Paul devotes 40 words to the Christian wife. 40 words. To the husband, we get 115 words. That's three times, almost three times as many. Probably because we need more help and so he repeats himself often in this passage. What does headship mean? Again, I've gone to John Piper. I thought it was a helpful definition here on the screen. The divine calling of a husband to take primary responsibility for Christ-like servant leadership, protection and provision in the home. The only issue I've got, uh, I've got a slight issue there is the last little phrase, provision in the home. I think that is almost you know, Western imposed uh, upon our reading of the scriptures because there may come, a, 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 there may come a, a marriage where the husband is not able to provide for his wife. Does that cease to be a Christian marriage? No. Or it may come a point in time and you might even be in this situation where your wife can earn a packet more than you and so she's actually the main breadwinner. So I, I, I'm not convinced about that the Bible says the husband has got to be the breadwinner. I think... By and large, that's generally how it works. But anyhow, that aside, I think it's a helpful, I think it's a helpful little line there to describe headship. But did you notice, under the role of the Christian husband, the word headship never turns up in the passage there. It actually is, turns up in the passage addressed to wives. In the verse addressed to, so nowhere does Paul say, Christian men, be head over your wife. Or Christian husband, exercise your headship. doesn't say that at all. And so look at the passage there. What's the key word that stands out for you? If you look at that passage addressed to husbands, the key word that keeps coming up is the word, not headship, it doesn't even turn up there. The key word is love. Turns up six times in the passage here. Three times, verse 25, verse 28, verse 33, three times we're specifically told, husbands, love your wives. Or wife, should be. Don't love your... Just one. Three times he says, husbands, love your wife. Three times, same line. And it's a love, notice, that's modelled and based on Christ's love for his church. So maybe you're sitting there today and you think the wife's call of submission is a big one, and it is. Perhaps he's a harder role for the husband. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. How does Christ love the church? By dying on a cross for her by showing self-sacrificial love for her, by giving himself completely for the well-being of his bride, by laying down his life for her. Notice the progression of verbs, the doing words. He loved, he gave, he made holy or sanctified, he cleansed to present her. Here is a picture of undying love and then... It's given over to the husband where God says, Christian husbands, here's how you exercise your headship. Love as Christ loved the church. And we say, please God, can we swap the roles around? See, the husband's headship finds its model in the headship 
and love and sacrifice of the Lord Jesus at Calvary. The Christian man, husband, finds his model of what does it mean to love his wife in the no greater love of the cross and the empty tomb. So Christian husband, spirit-filled husband, men who take seriously God's word, love your wife in such a way that serves her and puts her needs before your own. Love your wife in such a way that builds her up in the most holy faith, that promotes her emotional and physical well-being, that enables her to use her God-given talents for God's glory. Christian men, love your wife in such a way that you give of yourself to encourage her to grow in holiness. And if you were here last week, I encouraged the men to think seriously about women's convention. We heard about it today from Aggie again. Let me throw the challenge out there as well. Christian husband, do all you can to free your wife up so she can get to next Saturday's women's convention because she'll learn to fight the good fight, to run the race, to keep the faith. Don't say, well, Saturday mornings I do this. Whatever, give it up for your wife. Encourage her to get there if she can. Christian husband, love your wife in such a way that you want to present her one day to God, pure, spotless, radiant, without blemish, just like on your wedding day, if you can remember back that far for some of you, some of us. Love your wife in such a way that we give before we get. God's word is saying to Christian husbands here this morning, love your wife, love your wives, love your wife. How? Well, look at how Jesus loves the church. Does the challenge get any greater than that? Is there any bloke among us who's ready to say, don't really need God's help for that? Now I do realise that some here today might feel the weight of this Bible talk um, more than others. Perhaps if you're married to an unbeliever, that's very hard. We pray for you. We care for you. We love you. We want to help you. But you might feel the weight of this Bible talk more than others here because of divorce or separation. And if that's you, then please hear that divorce is not the unforgivable sin. It's never the unforgivable sin. And that Jesus' blood is powerful enough to deal with your past. Anything I've shared today, more than happy to talk about. I know Pastor Adam would be the same and our wives are there for you as well. The Christian home, you see, with Christian husbands and wives is never a place of perfection. I don't need to tell you that, but I'll say it anyway. There's no husband or wife on the face of this this earth who carries out these commands consistently and regularly. We all sin. We all struggle. We all fall short of God's mark. God's standard. Every Christian marriage is marred and muddied by sin. We're all a work in progress. We all fail to achieve God's high standards for our marriage. Which is why we cry out for help again and again. And it's why we gather regularly for Christian fellowship, for support, for accountability on a Sunday and in a fellowship group as well. We need it desperately. And it's why we pray I need no other argument. I have no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Brothers and sisters, here's a chapter in God's book from the creator of marriage given over to us to help us be spirit-filled, to have spirit-filled homes. And what God has established in creation, no culture, or government, or society will ever destroy it. 
You see, culture and society will destroy itself before it ever destroys God's good design for the home. Sisters and brothers, here's a chapter in God's book from the creator of marriage to be taken seriously. And if the Christian husband loves his wife in a Christ-like manner, and what woman would not desire that? And if a Christian wife submits to her husband in joy, and what man would not desire that, then we automatically witness to the gospel of grace. We automatically point others, including our own children and those not married, we're pointing people to God's love for us in Christ. Even if it's a flawed picture, we're still pointing people to God's love for his church. And even though it's not an easy passage, I get that, I know that firsthand, I know it's not an easy passage and I know it's definitely not a popular passage across society today, it is still a beautiful one in God's sight. And his ways will always be the best.